Good morning and welcome to the Atlantic Council. My name is Kelly Curry and I'm a non-resident senior fellow here at the Council. I'm dual hatted to the Indo-Pacific Initiative at the Scowcroft, Secure, at the Scowcroft Center for Security and um, Strategy. And I'm also wearing my other hat today um, with the Freedom and Prosperity Center here at the Council. It's my honor to be with you today to introduce a wonderful statesman and leader in Euro-Atlantic relations. Mircea Joanna is the NATO Deputy Secretary General. He was appointed to that position in October 2019, and he was the first Deputy Secretary General from Romania, and the first from any of the countries that joined NATO at the end, since the end of the Cold War. He also served as ambassador to the United States in 1996 to 2000, which is when I first met him as a young congressional staffer who was um, buoyed and excited by the promise of the period following the Cold War. Um, Romania was just beginning their NATO accession talks. They were becoming a member of the Partnership for Peace. And um, during this time, uh, Mircea was one of the, the leaders in promoting Romania's role as part part of the North Atlantic Alliance and as part of the new post-Cold War configuration. He went on to serve as Romania's foreign minister and as a long-serving senator in the Romanian Senate, including serving as the president of the Romanian Senate. As I noted, he is a longtime advocate of Euro-Atlantic integration. As an architect by training, it should be no surprise to us that he has helped to build the scaffolding and design the structure of our modern Euro-Atlantic security and policy coordination mechanisms. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to also introduce Dan Negria, who is the um, head of our Freedom and Prosperity Center, the director of that center. And he and I served together at the State Department, where he was a special Special representative for business and commerce affairs, um, and also served on the policy planning staff of the Secretary of State. This followed a successful career in finance and a um, stint in the Romanian uh, Financial uh, Ministry of Finance, um, where he, he defected to the United States um, from Communist Romania. Uh, today, we will be joined by a Zoom audience, and our Zoom audience should feel free to enter their questions and the, use the Q&A function in Zoom. We will be taking questions from the audience and here in the studio and from our Zoom audience. So it is, again, my pleasure to turn over the conversation to Dan and Mircea, and we look forward to an exciting and enlightening conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kelly. Uh, Binatsvenit la Consilio Atlantic, Domnole Joanna. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. Um, welcome also to the Freedom and Prosperity Center, which we are leading. Um, in addition to the audience that we um, have in person here, we have over 150 people participating remotely from um, a total of 32 countries. I would like to recognize uh, three distinguished um, members of our in person audience Ambassador Kelly, just provide the introduction, was U.S. representative at UNESCO. Uh, we also have with us Frank Finelli, currently a partner at the Carlyle Group, and the former senior aide to Senator Dan Coates, and uh, Mr. Frank Kramer, who is a director of the um, uh, Atlantic Council and was assistant secretary <coughs> of defense for international <coughs> and security affairs. We are particularly happy to have you here and benefit from your wisdom. This, um, um, uh, this conversation uh, is being um, 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 live streamed, but also we are recording it and it will be available on our website. For people who are tr studying what we are studying, the relationship between freedom and prosperity. And Eastern Europe is particularly interesting to us because it is one of those rare opportunities in social sciences that we have a clean case study where you have a number of countries that are starting from the same starting point. Under communism, the countries that are currently in Eastern Europe um, were in the same place in terms of freedom. None of them had freedom. They didn't have economic freedom, didn't have political freedom, they didn't have legal freedom. Um, in terms of their level of development, they are approximately in the same place. The vast majority were what the World Bank would categorize as middle-income countries, somewhere a little bit above, somewhere a little bit below, 
None were very poor and none of them was Switzerland. So that was 1990. 30 years later, we are looking back and these countries have ma made drastically <coughs> different decisions in terms of their freedom. And now they're running the gamut from a brutal dictatorship like Russia and, and <coughs> Belarus to imperfect democracies, to varying degrees of imperfection, to vibrant democracies like the Baltics, like uh, the Czech Republic, like Romania. And we also see the impact on prosperity of these countries. <coughs> so we will ask you a few questions about that. But at the same time, and especially given your position at NATO, there is no prosperity and there is no freedom without security. If you have a civil war like in Yugoslavia, you can't have either, or if you are Ukraine and you've been invaded twice. So maybe we should start with security. <laughs> so would you please give us your perspective of where is Eastern Europe in the new um, security architecture that we are seeing in Europe following the Ukraine invasion? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Dan, for, for having me. Mulțumesc pentru invitație. It's like feeling uh, coming home. Uh, thank the Atlantic Council and the Freedom and Prosperity Center for, for having me. And uh, I know there are lots of uh, friends uh, in this very hall and many others uh, watching uh, uh, our conversation uh, uh, in, a, in a digital way, virtual, including in my home country of Romania, our home country of Romania, where uh, I salute the Project Romania 2030 partnership with, with your center. <clears throat> it's in a way, uh, I think there is some form of, of symmetry in, in people's lives because I started, let's say, my international career being five years as Romania's ambassador, very young, uh, to Washington. And as Kelly has said, you know, uh, running like crazy uh, to convince American legislature and American administration, American public, that my country, Romania, deserved to be a member of NATO. And the symmetry is that I will be probably having five years in NATO uh, uh, after a complex uh, career in politics and diplomacy. Uh, so in a way, I started uh, with the obsession uh, that Romania had and uh, the Poles had and the Czechs had and the Bolts had, that we have to be part of the Euro-Atlantic family. And in a way, there is God. Uh, uh, I hope not towards the end of my career, I have this great job uh, as number two, and uh, uh, I want to say how much I appreciate the uh, Assembly General Stoltenberg's, not only decision to pick me, which was great, uh, but also his steady hand in uh, the helm. Um, there is an absolute direct connection between freedom, prosperity, and security. There is absolutely nothing in our lives, but nothing. No business, no personal life, no tranquility, no dreams, uh, no hope if we don't have peace and stability. And the business of NATO is to make sure that this very foundation of peace and stability is preserved for the 1 billion people, including 20 million Romanians and Finns, and hopefully soon Swedes, uh, that are part of our great alliance. And next year we'll be in Washington to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the greatest alliance in human history. And every single time when we go and look into the complexities of today's world, or yesterday's world, or tomorrow's world, we are always coming back to the value proposition that NATO embodies. And this is freedom, this is democracy, and this is the rule of law. And I, I, I certainly, uh, with this, this war that uh, Russia started against innocent Ukraine and so many other issues that are tormenting today's world, people start to see again, even the ones who are not, uh, you know, sometimes I preach to the choir, I meet people that already believe in NATO, but I, I go to, to universities, I see young people. Uh, I was at Stanford, I will be giving the commencement speech at Virginia Tech next, next Sunday, when I go in my home country of Romania, when I go everywhere, and I start to feel that also the younger generations uh, who are not accustomed to live uh, with war in Europe anymore. So it's sort of a distant memory of our forefathers. Um, and now they see that NATO is such a relevant organization. And again, I come back, irrespective of how many airplanes and fighter jets and tanks that we need to have, 
-hmm. or how strong you are on cyber or on anything else, in the end, is the values. And I think for countries in my part of Europe, in the former communist uh, Europe, I think that proposition is probably even more intense than for others that have been living in democracy and freedom for, for centuries. We cherish freedom. We value democracy. And if sometimes democracies are imperfect, uh, I don't try to find excuse to anyone uh, or to no one, is that there is not an easy proposition to, 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 to rebuild a free society with modern political and economic institutions, the reflexes and the culture of a people that live for 50 years in communism. Because the destruction and the social engineering that Soviet Russia and then communist uh, ideologies did to our countries is a severe trauma. And people expect that, you know, uh, you know it's one maybe. or two generations. So I come from that group of leaders from my part of Europe intensely believing in a transatlantic connection, intensely believing that there is a connection between freedom, democracy, and rule of law, and also the fact that there is a chance for nations like ours, like my country of Romania, like Poland, like the Czech Republic, or who else, that if we do the right things, we could avoid the middle income trap, and we could really go to the first echelon of developed nations. I think there is nothing shorter than this ambition that we all share, being members of NATO, member of European Union, also a great achievement. I signed the negotiations uh, for Romania joining uh, the EU as well. That's a very nice, it's a very nice, uh, you know, uh, tandem of institutions. But I think there is nothing short of the ambition that if we strengthen our institutions, political, economic, if we cherish our freedom, and also have better governance and less corruption, and more transparency in what we do, I, I believe that our part of Europe would and should become part of the developed uh, part of it. And also, why not be an inspiration for other nations that are still struggling with this thing? Okay, you develop, and then you reach a plateau, and then you suffocate somehow, and then you have a problem with going to the real deal, and historically, there are not that many nations that made it uh, to the top. I was just amazed by the state visit of the president of South Korea to Washington. And, you know, he, he also uh, doing, Thanks, yeah. wow, wonderful. And we met him uh, for the first time uh, at our NATO summit in Madrid last year, when we had for the first time the four leaders of the Indo-Pacific, uh, Australia, Japan, Korea, and, and New Zealand. And I think that if this part of Europe uh, will declare victory, is, and the end of history is not joining NATO and the EU, uh, the real ambition for our part of Europe uh, is to really make sure that we become, I, th I don't think we'll be Switzerland necessarily, but why not believe that you can be the Belgium or the Netherlands uh, or the Denmark, or why not Sweden or Finland? Uh, and I think this is something that should be uh, the next level of ambition for, for, for my part of, of the world and also for my home country of Romania. So it's interesting that you mentioned the middle income trap. It's uh, something that our center spends time on, a lot of countries manage to overcome abject poverty and, and show some progress, but then stop at that level which uh, currently in PPP calculations by the World Bank, it's something like 12,500 or something like that, and they are stuck. And you are right, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, there were only about nine countries that managed to, to, to get over, but that's a, get, a great accomplishment and a great goal to have, which is a perfect segue to the next question that I'm really eager to, to ask you, because again, our work um, is global, but uh, Eastern Europe is such an inspiration uh, to many other countries who, who want to, to make progress, which is, what were the successful reforms that were made by countries that have done well and usually, I mean, there is this great quote from Margaret Thatcher, uh, uh, the most worthwhile things are very, very hard. I'm sure they were hard. Corruption, I know, was, was one of them. But what were the big, successful, transformative reforms that the countries that have made it went through? You know, there was no uh, textbook uh, for transitioning Europe after the fall of communism. We never did that before. 
And of course, at that time, it was the Washington consensus dominating, you know, ideologically and politically, free markets and, uh, you know, uh, and democracy. And after long years of difficult transition, I think I can have some, some sort of a, I, I would say, uh, not very profound, but some form of empirical uh, conclusions, at least for me. It is clear that success of a nation depends uh, on the quality of its political and economic institutions. Political and economic institutions. So I think sometimes we made a mistake in separating in silos the political reforms, which democracy, parliaments, uh, oversight uh, of uh, legislatures over the government, things that belong to the democratic realm. And then the economic institutions. How the, how the market functions. Uh, are the supervisory agencies doing their work? See, it's not only the government, the myriad of economic institutions, including what kind of model of capitalism do you embrace? Because there's not one capitalism around the world. There is a big philosophical, ideological, and political uh, uniform, which is freedom, rule of law, capitalism, liberal democracy. But there are subspecies. Anglo-Saxon capitalism is not identical with the Rhine, the German-inspired one on European continent. It is not. Scandinavian model of social contract and economy is not the same with the one we have in the Mediterranean part. And thus, former communist Europe is, in my, in my you know, uh, empirical uh, analysis, is a subspecies of the greater family of liberal democracies and market economies. And where I think we did well was where we also had our public opinions convinced that those reforms are also benefiting the average, average citizen and not only the elites. And I do believe that uh, uh, successful nations, including in my part of Europe, including my home country of Romania, will be successful and the middle income trap could be avoided if we also instill in these universal values, some form of local cultural identity, culture not in terms of going to the museum, but in terms of the culture of the land. So I think where we are very successful, where we had uh, large corporations coming uh, to Romania, I remember uh, uh, going with the, as ambassador with President Emil Constantinescu, who was a great leader uh, in terms of uh, his role for getting Romania into NATO. And I remember going with former Congressman Tom Lantos. Uh, he was from San Francisco, uh, Tom. And he introduced us to uh, Oracle, uh, to Cisco, I don't know who else. And now Oracle has in Romania the third largest office in the world. Thousands of, of, of engineers. So when I say where uh, the culture uh, of American or Western companies uh, uh, transferred to Romania, let's say, things went well. But, you, but when you go to the uh, SMEs, to the smaller enterprises, to, to local government, to national government, things were a little bit more complicated. So I think uh, national ownership is also important. And I think you have to work with your strong points. Romanians are very creative. Romanians are very ad adaptable. They're very sociable, I think. Um, uh, but we are not identical. Uh, with, I say, Estonians or with the Finns. And I think in this diversity, there is also beauty. So what I think was the strong point is that we embraced uh, with, with great intensity the values of democracy, rule of law, uh, and freedom. But also what we did not do well was to reflect also a sort of a national characteristics of our subspecies of capitalism and liberal democracy. And here, this is where I think the uh, successful nations like Korea or Taiwan or others uh, were able to do was basically they embraced the values that America and the West uh, did, but the Japanese model is not identical with the American model. And I think success is this breeding between fundamental values of uh, liberal democracy and free markets and also some form of, and thus you, you have the respect of your own people and you start being respected uh, by the others when they look to you. So I think that our part of Europe is now becoming mature. Uh, the war in Ukraine and the fact that Russia has decoupled on its own from civilized Europe and Ukraine is coming and Moldova is coming and Georgia, uh, all of them will be coming towards the West. 
I think uh, the center of gravity in Europe is moving east. And I think this is a huge chance for the nations in my part of Europe to really go and play major league. Hmm. And I think there is nothing short of that ambition that this part of Europe will and should, if we do the right things, and if we believe that only the strategic relevance brings you to the top, no. It's a precondition, like security and peace are the precondition for prosperity. Uh, strategic relevance is the precondition for economic success and development. That's my strong belief after many years uh, in and out uh, of government. Um, you are very easy to work with because you give perfect cues for the next question. So, I mean, I, I, will, I will have this interview as a model for other people. You mentioned different models of capitalism, uh, and you mentioned the global scene. Um, China is offering uh, an authoritarian <laughs> capitalism, maybe, model. Uh, Xi Jinping recently uh, uh, gave this speech, and he says, uh, you don't need to westernize to modernize. And uh, westernize is a, a code word, a shorthand for you don't need freedom for development. I would love to have your perspective on how um, China's desire to be present in Eastern Europe has manifested itself. They have an investment in the port of Piraeus, for example, there. Uh, Belt and Road uh, is trying to make inroads in Eastern Europe. Would love your perspective of how it is received and what kind of influence it, that it has had so far. You're right. Um, uh, all of us have read attentively uh, the very long speech, but the important speech that President Xi gave of the Party Congress uh, just, I think, a few months back. And I think uh, the line that really attracted my attention uh, the most was, uh, I quote uh, from memory, I think China is offering an alternative pathway to development to the world. And then he said, is not the Western model. But the first proposition, the first fundamental proposition that they're basically offering not only to China, to, is in, in the way it's, it's their country, they can decide whatever system they want to have, but they are proposing an alternative pathway to development for the rest of the world. And you're right, what they're offering is a sort of a Faustian pact, that you give up your individual freedoms on the altar of a presumed collective economic security. That's the trade-off. For people like us <laughs> who have lived in communism, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's banal to say that this is cannot work. There is nothing more precious than individual freedom. There's nothing more awful than having a big brother giving you marks on your tweets and your social media. And if you're a good citizen or a bad citizen up, upon your beliefs. This is something that for me is, is no go. But for many countries in the developing South, in many countries that are also having some form of, you know, uh, memories with the West, colonial past, hegemonic impulses. The Chinese model could be attractive, or even if it's not attractive because also people love freedom all over the world, that's a feature of human beings. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. That's God made us who we are. Uh, I don't believe that there are uh, nations more prone to democracy and others less. No. But for reasons of practicality or for reasons of strategic hedging between the big blocks that are now uh, uh, you know coalescing America and its allies and China and its partners uh, many countries will be tempted to say okay let's hedge and let's try to have this model for dictators it works perfectly well yeah. they keep you in power if you have a problem you get the Wagner group to protect you and your cronies. And for others who are relatively, let's say, uh, in, in, in a more solid situation, they say, OK, why not hedge? And get some money from the Chinese, get some money from Europe, get some money from the Americans, and then we'll get a better deal. Hey, the ones who are trying to get a better deal are our, uh, I think, our target uh, in terms of 
also us in the West proposing a better alternative to, to, to them. So of course we say and we believe and we are intensely sincere in saying that freedom, democracy, and rule of law are the solution. But sometimes we've been a little bit parochial, a little bit sometimes, a little bit arrogant, telling them what to do, saying that uh, our values are their values, and having this sort of a cultural identity not recognized that much. So I think for us, as I see a fantastic unity inside the democratic world, I've never seen, and I've been in this game for many years, we've been in this game for many years, I've never seen NATO more united than today. I've never seen America's allies from all over the world um, you know, being so strong and so determined. But the rest of the world, which will be the ones who will make the difference in the new system of world order and the balance of power and the balance of economic power in the world, we need to do a much better job in convincing them that the democracy camp and the freedom camp is also the developing camp, the camp of respect, and this is why I believe I also do lots of partnerships for NATO. We have 40 nations as our partners in NATO, and I invest a lot of our time on behalf of our Secretary General to make sure that also NATO does its part in convincing these allies, uh, these partners of ours, that it's... And I do believe that this, is, this will be, uh, you know, uh, keeping the unity of the West uh, and also convincing uh, the rest that going towards freedom rule of law and democracy also pays off in terms of economic prosperity. I think this is the real, uh, the real, uh, you know, determinant factor for how uh, our kids and grandkids will be, will be living in the next uh, decades or, or so. Well, I have many questions, but I will ask only one because we have an, uh, a great audience and I'm sure there will be great questions from the audience. I don't want to be selfish and ask all the questions. But there is one question that interests me a lot. Uh, the European Union. Uh, many um, um, uh, people in the United States and in the UK who voted for Brexit um, believe that in the EU you have a bunch of unelected bureaucrats who lord it over these countries and come up with a lot of regulations and so on. Um, you were kind enough to invite it, our center to contribute to the Aspen Romania volume uh, last year. And our analysis showed that the countries, uh, former communist countries in Eastern Europe, that became members of the EU did much better than those that, that didn't. What is your opinion on the role of the EU for these countries that came from the lawlessness of the communist regime and needed to make this difficult transition? Was it helpful or, or, or not? I strongly believe that NATO and the EU are two sides of the same coin. It's about the political West. And for nations that have been, in a way, having the huge misfortune to be amputated from our natural family, which is the political Western democracies. It was a necessity to have our security covered by NATO and also the prosperity part to be covered also by this combination between NATO and the EU. Of course, uh, no institution is perfect, and the EU has also its, its weaknesses, but it's also a superb political innovation in world history. We never had uh, a congregation of nations on purpose giving up some of their national sovereignty on the altar of doing things together. And this is something remarkable. It's against the natural instinct of political leaders and also of peoples. I mean, sometimes there is not enough transparency or sometimes there is discontent with the bureaucracy in Brussels. That's a fact. But also I would say this is not undermining uh, the uniqueness of the European project, and I think this is a project that we should continue to invest into. If nations decide to opt in or opt out, that's their own decision. The UK is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a global power. It has a specific uh, history and a specific connection to America and to the Anglo-Saxon world, the Commonwealth. So they have probably other options. But for nations on the continent, I think EU uh, is a must. By the way, I, uh, speaking of my <laughs> already long career, uh, I negotiated the European Constitution. I signed the original of the Constitution, which was adopted in 2004. And then it was sabotaged uh, by referenda in France and the Netherlands, was voted against. And now what we have, the, the Lisbon Treaty and the uh, founding treaties are, in fact, some, some 
a sort of a compilation of the formal constitution, hmm. which are now transferred into uh, the treaties of the EU. But having said what I said about uh, our part of, of, of Europe, I think we benefit tremendously for EU integration. But now is the time, as the center of gravity is shifting, I have an intense ambition that in the next years, this will take time, to erase the distance and, the, and even the, the, the definition between new member states or new allies and older or founding member states or allies. And look at Spain. Look at Spain. They came, like Portugal, after military dictatorship. OK? And I think that Spain is one a superb example of a nation that is coming and catching up and catching up. And now the ambition, uh, uh, President uh, Sanchez uh, says, uh, el hambre uh, del futuro, uh, the, the, you know, uh, you know being, being hungry for the future. And what he wants to do with Spain, and other leaders, I think, want to do the same, is to go to among the EU8, the eight most developed EU nations, and that's no surprise, Scandinavian nations and Germany and a few others. So I think that for Eastern Europe, for former Eastern Europe, the ambition is not only uh, to be more influential and basically the center of gravity in Europe uh, to also be uh, an economic center of gravity moving east, but I think, in fact, to be part of the political power sharing and economic power sharing and strategic power sharing. But in order to be there and to erase the difference between new members and older members is also for you an obligation to know how to play the game, to realize that you have to modernize your institutions, that you have to do a better job in strengthening your democracy, that you have to have checks and balances, that you have independent judiciary, that you have to fight corruption. So I think that if our part of Europe understands that this is a chance for us to really re-become equal part of the European project as we used to be before communism. Hmm. My country of Romania was, was uh, uh, richer than Switzerland. Switzerland, between the two world wars, was borrowing gold from Romania. Romania was richer than Sweden before the Second World War. Same country. But with a caveat that 50 years, we are forced into the darkness of communism. So I think that's the real ambition for my part of Europe, and that's what NATO is so useful. Because here in NATO, I can see it from, from the top of my organization. I see the maturity of the new, member, uh, new allies, how they play uh, the cards, and how uh, solid they are. And if we transfer this to the EU as well, and also to the economic and democratic models, I think our countries will be immense success. Uh, and that I think we should have no uh, less of an ambition than for us to really erase de facto the difference between new and old, East and West, North and South, because in fact, we are a big solid family of democracies, freedom loving uh, and embracing capitalism and, and, and freedom in all its uh, forms and manifestations. Full stop. Splendid. Being uh, generously inclined, I will let the audience ask questions, although I'm sure that there are shy and withdrawn people here, but I will take. This is first. not my recollection of the Atlantic Council. I think they have very direct questions. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for coming today uh, and for uh, the Atlantic Council for having this opportunity. Uh, the Atlantic Council is the finest nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C., and it's become a mecca for um, uh, people who have uh, influence on the world stage to appear. Uh, no issue uh, affects um, uh, Eastern Europe uh, and Europe as a whole, as well as Asia than the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, I'm particularly concerned that these uh, brave uh, soldiers from Ukraine are fighting the battle on their own. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, NATO could possibly consider allowing individual NATO members to send troops into Ukraine uh, to fight along with the Ukrainians with the proviso that if Russia should attack the countries that are supporting Ukraine, that that would invoke uh, Article 5 of uh, the, uh, uh, the NATO uh, alliance for full protection. Uh, by 
doing this, the individual nations could decide on their own uh, what troops they're able to uh, deploy, and it would provide uh, an, an immediate boost to the Ukrainians. Uh, thank you for considering my input, sir. Well, thank you so much. Let me very, be very clear. The sacrosanct duty of NATO is to protect allies. Article 5, uh, and that's what we do. We strengthen the eastern flank of NATO. We are reinventing our defense planning processes as we speak. We are bringing innovation and new technologies at the forefront. We are keeping the unity of NATO and defending every square inch of NATO soil. That's the number one obligation of NATO. The other one obligation of NATO that we do as an organization and allied nations individually and collectively also in the Rammstein process, when more than 50 nations, not only the 31, 32 NATO countries, but many other partners of ours from all over the world, we are supporting Ukraine massively on military, uh, logistical, uh, and practical support for them to win the war that they deserve uh, to win, and we'll be supporting them to win. And this is the second obligation we have. The third obligation on top of the first two is to make sure that we don't escalate already a very bloody war into a even greater war between NATO and Russia. And this is the obligation also we have, Secretary General, myself, all of us, our leaders. And I think we've done a pretty good job in supporting Ukraine. Now they're preparing to launch, we hope, a successful counteroffensive. Look at the volume. Today, I think, uh, the US has announced another 1.2 billion US dollars for additional help. And also Europe is helping a lot. We think mainly uh, the military help for Ukraine, but look at the economic support and macroeconomic stability support, and look to the, the huge amounts of money that, you know, uh, EU uh, and, uh, and other partners are doing to uh, helping Ukraine. Look at the humanitarian support. I, I, I see uh, and I know, you know, cases like uh, an orphanage from Odessa, Ukraine, they have moved to Constanza uh, on the Romanian Black Sea shore. So if we look at what we are doing for Ukraine, it's nothing short of formidable. So I think our number one obligation is to keep the unity of our support for Ukraine. And if we do that, I know the Ukrainians will prevail with our help, but without transforming already a bloody war into an even bigger war between you know, nuclear superpowers. And this is something that we also have to keep in mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Christian Ionetti. I work for the Central and Eastern Europe team at the National Democratic Institute. Uh, my question for you, uh, disinformation seems like it's a growing threat, not just in our region, but in Europe as a whole. What are some steps you think um, that the Eastern European countries can take to counter disinformation and to protect democracy, but also security? Thank you. Thank you very much in Washington. Um, uh, many more. Um, you know, this is a, um, uh, a sort of a hybrid toolbox that Russia and also others have perfected over time. As that happened now, it started many years back. And also for countries in our part of Europe, in my country and other countries, there is, you know, uh, a very uh, difficult place for Russia to place its pro-Russian propaganda because we don't believe the Russians for historical and, and geographical reasons. But also they are quite good in exploiting the fractures uh, within our democratic societies, from America all the way uh, to the Republic of Moldova. And I would say the Republic of Moldova today, of course, leaving Ukraine, which is bloody uh, war, uh, short of military warfare, I think what Russia is fomenting in Repo Republic of Moldova is a total hybrid warfare against this country and against our democratic nations. So what we need to do is what I think we do in NATO. Our specialized colleagues in public diplomacy are working with the EU and the G7. I was uh, in Silicon Valley just before coming to Washington, and I talked to, to also to, to many uh, big tech companies that also have specialized uh, tools and also obligations to help us uh, defend ourselves and not make sure that this propaganda uh, insidiously uh, is eroding our very democratic foundation. So what I can say that we have to do uh, much more together. I'm also working with the EU Commissioner Jourova, a splendid leader. Uh, she's Czech. 
Uh, and I plan also to, to work uh, even closer uh, with the EU, with the US, and also private sector. I think we have to do a much better job, not only on innovation that I lead in NATO, but also in fighting this information, we, work, we need to work with the private sector and civil society. This is the, 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 the holy triad, if you want, of our democracies. Government, private sector, NGOs, organizations like yours working in sync and making sure that we have a united democratic front against a very dangerous, insidious, and relentless enemy, which is in fact trying to destroy the very foundation of trust that we have in our democratic nations. And I also emphasize again our obligation to help the Republic of Moldova. Uh, they are partners of NATO. They've been given a European pers uh, perspective by the EU, also Ukraine, hope, also hopefully Georgia. And I think um, this, is a, this is crunch time. Uh, and helping Maya Sandu's administration, I think, is an obligation uh, to help a great leader uh, from, from our part of Europe. Hello, Deputy Secretary Joanna. And um, first of all, I'd like to commend Dan Degree and the Atlantic Council for the Freedom and Prosperity Index, which I think really provides needed thought leadership for the global policy community. And then secondly, uh, to pass along my heartfelt congratulations on recalling back over 25 years ago when you and the ambassador here, when we first met, uh, fighting for uh, Romanian access to NATO. Uh, to where you are today as the Deputy Secretary General. That is uh, tremendous. Um, Mr. Deputy Secretary, you've talked about the Ramstein process for security assistance. I'd like you to, to get your thoughts on maybe projecting forward a bit to what NATO's role would be in the reconstitution of uh, a free Ukraine, uh, hopefully getting it to the top of the Freedom and Prosperity Index, hopefully not in the, in the near future. Thank you so much, and I would like to thank all the American leaders on both sides of the aisle. I remember vividly how Senator Coates was starting to cry when we had the first democratic transfer of power in my home country of Romania. I remember Senator uh, John McCain or Joe Lieberman and so many wonderful leaders that were understanding the huge role uh, that America has for our renewed freedom and democracy. So, you know, my heart is always with, with, with our friends. Um, there is a direct connection between freedom and prosperity and between the quality of institutions and prosperity. And I think uh, what we are doing as we speak, and I'm heartened to see that our Ukrainian friends and partners, during a very difficult war, they come to NATO, to us, and say, we want to continue the process of reforming our institutions, fighting corruption, bringing transparency. And in, in war, it's not always easy to do two things at the same time. You have to survive, you have to fight, you have to resist. And also, I think they have the wisdom and the foresight for them to know that the real, the real, real, uh, you know, uh, 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 objective for Ukraine is of course to win the war as a precondition because security is important, but then to become a prosperous uh, European nation. So I only hope that they will also learn from the experience of my country of Romania or of Poland, let's say the two larger countries in our part uh, uh, of NATO and the EU, and to see that there is a need for them to be brave, we'll support them, but also to make sure that the quality of institutions, political, economic, transparency, good governance, are indispensable uh, because the real, uh, the real, uh, I think, ambition for, uh, for a great country like Ukraine is not only to be part of the West, because they will be part of the West. If they wish so, and if they do the right things, they will be part of the West. But also not to be any part of the West, to be a prosperous, successful part of the West. And I think they're holding the ingredients. And I think continuing reforms domestically while continuing to fighting the war bravely is the right mix. And this is something we encourage with our friends in Ukraine. Good morning, Mr. Deputy Secretary. Uh, it's really wonderful to see you again. I think the first time we met was probably a long time ago, 1996. Um, one of the issues that's facing uh, NATO, uh, as well as the European Union, transatlantic nations, is the issue that uh, uh, President von der Leyen uh, described as de-risking. Um, and 
this goes to the issue of how much reliance can we have on countries like China, of course in Europe the issue of uh, reliance on natural gas from Russia and the like uh, demonstrated the, the problem. So as you think about innovation, which I know is one of your key areas, how do you think about the de-risking set of issues? How do you think about supply chains? How do you think we ought to all set ourselves going forward? And in that connection, how can we work uh, closely with some key countries of the global south on these, on these kinds of issues? Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you again, and uh, uh, I cherish our friendship. Um, you know, the, um, we have to learn the lesson from our uh, dependency on Russian uh, natural resources as Europeans. And I think we should be aware of the fact that we risk now to replace one dependency on Russian natural resources with another dependency uh, on China on many, too many of our critical um, uh, supply chains. Nobody says that we should decouple from, from China, do not do business with China. There are many uh, ways in which business and trade should continue. That's good. But I think we should be far more careful in making sure that we are not replacing one dependency with the other, especially in critical sectors, especially in things that are related to our national security. And I'm, I'm happy to see that allies, and also the EU for that matter, speaking of uh, President von der Leyen, we are in a way uh, realizing uh, that world is complicated and you have to make sure that you continue to, to do trade but also protect your, uh, your critical uh, supply chains and infrastructures. Um, I remember the discussion we had uh, with, the, uh, with the U.S. administration uh, when Keith Crack was, was uh, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, of State for Economic Affairs visiting with us and Thierry Breton in the European Commission and trying to look into the 5G and Huawei. There are complex issues. So I believe that uh, export control, uh, uh, screening, uh, alternative uh, supply routes. What I think what the U.S. is now doing also in talking to, to Korea or Japan or Taiwan for, for microprocessing power. I think the EU has a legitimate interest in making sure that they are part of this, what I call allied reshoring. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, I think, will, will love this term. Uh, I think uh, Secretary Yellen used this, I think, uh, one and a half years ago. I'm looking at my country of Romania, uh, how the small uh, modular nuclear reactor technology is shared with, with companies in my home country of Romania. That's great. Mm -hmm. So I think also our uh, part of Europe should also be more proactive in reaching out uh, to our Western uh, friends and also our America's allies in the Indo-Pacific and make sure that we are part of this friendly reshoring. So once we have our security in place, then we can do, do business with China or whoever else. But I think there is a lot of work to be done. On NATO-EU cooperation, uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg and President von der Leyen, they established, we established a joint task force, NATO-EU, on critical undersea infrastructures. Mm -hmm. That's why I went to see Google in Silicon Valley because they are the owner of the largest network of undersea fiber optic on which our eco economy and finance depends because there's transfer of data between you know, uh, uh, the two sides of the Atlantic. So I believe that we should be uh, vigilant uh, and do a much better job. And NATO-EU cooperation on, on, on resilience in general uh, is, is very, very profound. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, Deputy Secretary General. I'm uh, Joseph Lemoyne. I'm the Deputy Director of the Freedom and Prosperity Center. I come here with the online question. And you just answered one of the two that I was going to ask. So I'll move to, to the, the other one. Um, it's the, is, is the role um, of the, um, the Three Seas Initiative for security, uh, freedom, and prosperity in the region. What, what do you think the, would be the, the role of this initiative? No, I, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, you're uh, knocking uh, to an open door. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm adamant about the connection uh, between democracy freedom, prosperity, and if I would add something which is related to, to Frank's question, I think also to bring innovation as a key dynamo for 
the transformation of my part of Europe to a very successful part of world economy and, and transatlantic community. And when I say innovation, I'm not referring only to technology. Innovation is a mindset. You have to innovate in the way you do politics, the way in which you run your government, uh, in which you run your judiciary, in which you uh, digitalize not only government but also the whole economy, how you help your startups, how do you have, like we have started in NATO, to create venture capital resources. We have, a, uh, we have the first ever multinational sovereign venture capital fund. Sounds like colliding, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, propositions. They're not, because we are the only organization in the world that was able to convince allies to put some money into a venture capital fund, which is run by venture capitalists. And also we have started uh, Diana, which is a collection of accelerators and test centers all over the Alliance. More than 100, uh, you know, such places are offered to our startups to test uh, fresh ideas and put some money and then go to the market. So I think the center could help not only, uh, and I'm happy this partnership happens with, uh, with an NGO in Romania, but I think it can be a tremendous guide and support, intellectual and practical support for the whole region uh, of Central Eastern Europe and Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia and the Western Balkans because they also need to be fully integrated into the West. So I would see a very multi interesting multi-regional role for the center in making sure that we have the analytical, the practical, and one other guidance uh, to, for, for all my region, all my regions uh, uh, to really go to the next level. And I think this is possible, I think this is necessary, and I think this will be strengthening our alliance uh, a great deal. Great. Thank you. I have another, another question, that time uh, from me. Uh, you mentioned the example of uh, South Korea as a great example of a country that passed the middle income trap. And then at another time you mentioned the importance of culture when you try to reach that point. And I think South Korea is a great example because they managed to create their own culture and then exported their culture and now they're becoming, you know, that's their, their main economy ex exporting their cultural products. How do, you, how do you set the conditions to promote that in your own country? How do you create that environment to, to have your own form of capitalism that works with your people that actually can you know, make you a brand on the international uh, market? Oh, thank you for raising that. And, um, you know, uh, reputation matters, trust matters, respect matters. And I'm a, I'm a huge, huge uh, uh, fan, uh, not only of, uh, of national branding, but also finding a coherent response between who you are, let's say Romanian or French or American or Korean, and what the outside world thinks about your nation. I think it's not two separate operations. One, to communicate with your own public and eventually win elections. Always important to win elections. And something different to the outside world. I think nations are just one integrated, coherent cultural reality. And Romanians, we know about and we think and we are proud of ourselves as being good at technical issues. Why? Because communism as Dan was, was saying, was basically has hyper-ideologized social sciences, and the refuge was, was in exact sciences, in math and physics. That's how we have the largest number of IT engineers, graduates per capita in Europe is Romania. <laughs> that's why Oracle has chosen Romania to be the third, uh, and Cisco, and that's why UiPath, uh, Daniel Dinesh's unicorn, is coming from Romania, and many others from our part, because science was not ideological, and that's the strength of my country. Then we have, uh, as King Charles uh, said when he was uh, not yet uh, the king uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of his great nation, uh, he was in love with Transylvania and Romania. He always said, protect, and he told me, uh, at the Buckingham Palace in 2019, when we had a NATO summit, the queen was still alive, said, uh, I want you to take care of your beautiful country. It's the most wonderful country in Europe. Please protect it. So Romania has the size of the UK, and it's one of the most splendid, naturally, beauty 
uh, in Europe, others do. So Romanians believe that we are good in tech, beautiful country, good, great nature, and also we are very creative. So I see for Romania a greater role for creative industries. I see the movie directors from Romania. I see musicians from Romania. I see lots of entrepreneurs from Romania. So I think that branding is not marketing. Branding is about the soul of a nation. It's about the respect you get from within and the respect you, 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 you earn from the outside. And I think this is something that all of us should do. Uh, of course, I'm doing branding for NATO as we speak. Uh, but that's why we do so successfully well in NATO, because inside we are who we are. We believe in our values. Uh, outside, we can project that sense of unity and purpose that we all share in NATO. Yeah, and I would add one thing that Ms. Jonathan made. Very good-looking people from Romania. <laughs> <laughs> Both uh, men and women. Especially the ones who, 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 who are sitting on my right-hand side here. <laughs> Um, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, wonderful having you here. Thank you very much. As I said, we will uh, make use of uh, your, your comments in many ways. Uh, we'll be tweeting about it. We'll, we'll be writing about it. So thank you very much. And um, indeed, I'm looking forward to be um, again with you in October. Uh, represent the center there with a the presentation at the, the forum you're organizing and Project Romania 2030. Uh, in Bucharest is our strategic partner, uh, not just for Romania, but for, for Eastern Europe, and we have projects to work together. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you all.